What does it mean to be a West Virginia Mountaineer? One of our school mottos is Mountaineers go first. And that doesn't mean that I'm the first one in the line for when they ring the lunch bell. This is Michael Hager. You know, what that means is Mountaineers are kind of trailblazers. We want to be first, the first person you look to when something bad happens, the first person to lend a helping hand. Michael lives up to that definition. He's a trailblazer from his hometown, a West Virginia University student, and the 69th Mountaineer mascot. So to me, the Mountaineer is the ultimate position of service, right? So I give up basically my entire year to show up at all these community events, to walk in all these parades. Uh, Like, I don't have a day of free time, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. One of my favorite quotes I've ever heard, Coach Huggins says, the best resource West Virginia has isn't coal, it's the people. And uh, we're very strong and proud people. We're proud of our culture, proud of our heritage. And, you know, it's awesome for me that I get to kind of live that out. Welcome to BYU Radio's Big Stories, a show dedicated to the incredible tales surrounding the opponents of the BYU Cougars. I'm your host, Cleon Wall. West Virginians take pride in their Mountaineers. In this episode, we will focus on five who blaze their own trails. We will recount one Mountaineer basketball legend's journey away from the state, only to return home to a hero's welcome. Three others have traveled across the sea to fulfill their football dreams in Morgantown, but we will begin with the living symbol of WVU, who's bringing hope to his hometown and the state. If you closed your eyes and envisioned the stereotypical mountaineer, a guy with a beard, long hair, coonskin cap, buckskin outfit, and a rifle, then you would perfectly describe Michael Hager's look. The beard, I started growing out in January, so I've been kind of lucky. I've got some pretty decent jeans. The native of Madison, West Virginia, didn't grow up dreaming of becoming the next Mountaineer. He had his sights set on becoming a sports star at Scott High School. So, you know, for football, we were really, really good when I was growing up. We had uh, Jordan Roberts, who won the Kennedy Award and actually played for the Chiefs for a little bit. Um, So, you know, Friday nights, the stadium was packed because we were always a top five, top ten team. Uh, You know, there's little kids playing football games in the back of the end zone, and I was out there slinging touchdown passes, pretending I was Jordan. Madison's a small town. It's one of the things I like about it. It's homey. Michael's mother, Melanie Martin, moved to Madison when she was 13. People know everybody. You can go to the grocery store and run into people, and they know who you are. The town has been through booms and busts, according to Scott High School teacher and Boone County Commissioner Brett Kuhn. Coal was the driving force behind our economy for 100 years. Over the past decade, we've seen the coal industry, the bottom file of the coal industry, and as a result, we've seen jobs leave, we've seen people leave, and uh, just it just seems that our way of life has been threatened here in Boone County because of all these losses. Slowly, as, as the mines closed and businesses went out of business and they just got ravished, burnt down, abandoned, and so it just made the town run down, I guess, a little bit. And as far as the coal mines, people get hurt. They get the pain pills. They're addicted. And then, it I don't know, it's almost like their kids followed in their footsteps of addiction. And that's sad. <laughs> There, there are definitely some struggles growing up in Boone County. You know, your small town, understaffed school system, underfunded school system, or, you know, your friends move away because their dads can't find work. With the economic downturn, uh, really, it came down, My, Michael had the option. Do I want to go down the path of, of drugs and doing things that I shouldn't be doing with some of my friends, or do I want to follow a different path? Michael's inner drive to be the best person that he can be, there was only one path he was going to take, and that was that was to graduate from Scott High School, and his dream was to go to WVU. Michael fulfilled that dream and earned a scholarship from the state. He also lived out his dream of playing on the same field as his heroes at Scott High School. I played football and baseball for four years at Scott. Michael was an undersized offensive lineman. I'm sitting here like 5'7", 170 if I eat really well. 
and he tried really hard to be a good baseball player. I really appreciate Coach Coon because I probably wasn't good enough my freshman year to make the baseball team. But I guess he saw some kind of potential in me and kept me around and kind of helped me develop a little bit. Uh, I probably learned just as much from him outside of the field as I learned on the field, you know. And then his senior year, he put cheer into it. <laughs> I was just like, hey, this could be funny. You know, I'm like ta tackling people on Friday night, holding girls in the air Saturday, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of a new and interesting challenge. So I never, ever in a million years thought I'd be a college cheerleader. And I just kind of stumbled into it and got lucky and ended up sticking at WVU and cheering for four years there. So part of my inspiration for becoming the Mountaineer was uh, Trevor Keese, who was the 65th Mountaineer. Uh, he was the Mountaineer my freshman year. So I remember seeing him at a tailgate interact with some young fans and the impact that he could have on them and the joy that he brought them. I'm like, this might be something that I could maybe try to do. You know, I might not have the impact of being able to stop Texas's running game, but I could have an impact that goes beyond the football field. Michael auditioned to be the 68th Mountaineer, but lost to Mary Roush. I did well enough to make it to the interview stage, but admittedly, I probably could have done a little bit better in some areas, so my interview didn't go nearly as well as I'd like it to. Michael and Mary became good friends, and she encouraged him to try out again. So in that year, I took time to become a stronger applicant. You know, I got involved in more community. When he tried this year, he said, I know what, I know what to say and I know what I need to do, you know, to help me get through to that final four. And he went out and did it. Losing the Mountaineer when I ran meant just as much as winning it the next year. Because now I can kind of be a beacon or in a role model to people that like, hey, you're not always gonna succeed at the first time you try something. Sometimes people are just gonna say no and you're gonna have to be okay with that. But being okay with that doesn't mean you have to accept that you're not good enough. It just means you need to try harder to become better. Tell you what, since, Mount, since Michael was named the Mountaineer, it has just been uh, nonstop. Folks are so happy for him, excited for him. And by being the Mountaineer, he is showing these students that are in Scott High School or Van High School or Sherman High School. Hey, you know what? A Boone County boy made it in Morgantown. I can too. Oh, extremely proud to be from Boone County. Uh, the people here are great. Uh, you know, a lot of them drove, made the three hour drive up to watch my in-person tryout and a lot of people came for the announcement before they even knew that I was gonna be the Mountaineer, you know? And it's like, people here want to be excited for something. They want to get behind something. So, you know, it's really cool for me that I get to give them something to get behind. Michael wants to back Boone County when he's done with college. His dream is to open a physical therapy practice in the area and coach football. You know, whether that's helping people understand that just because you tweaked your back, you don't need opioids to get over it and you just need to stretch a little bit. Or, you know, whether that's like, hey, you know, you're 13 years old, you're ready to go into high school, I can help train you and kind of get you physically ready for that. If I had to pick a title for my autobiography, it would probably be Leave It Better Than You Found It. I want to leave every organization and every event that I've ever get to be a part of better than it was when I first got there. And, you know, sometimes I don't succeed at that, but, you know, I can always try. I look forward to seeing what Michael's life story is going to be because I think it's going to be a positive role model for any Boone County, any West Virginian growing up and, and seeing the path that Michael takes. Coming up next, Hot Rod's hero's journey back to WVU. This is BYU Radio's Big Stories. It was controlled chaos inside of WVU Coliseum, the home of the Mountaineer basketball program. On this summer day, basketball campers were working on their skills to hopefully become the next Steph Curry, LeBron James, or Luka Doncic. I do wonder how many of the kids know about the legendary players from their state who have statues right outside of the arena. I would guess half of them would know a little about Jerry West. He had a distinguished career at West Virginia and in the NBA as a player and executive. I mean, the NBA's logo is based on him dribbling with his left hand. I'm not sure if the campers know much about the other guy. The graven image depicts a man shooting a hook shot with his right hand. The plaque below the statue states that number 33 was a self-made basketball player who played the game the way he wanted. 
The hookshot specialist is none other than Charleston, West Virginia native Hot Rod Hunley. And did he ever have an interesting basketball hero's journey? A lot of Utah Jazz fans remember Hot Rod's audio wizardry as the radio and TV play-by-play announcer for the team. But you should have seen him perform his magic on the court as a Mountaineer. You know, he was an entertainer. John Antonik is director of athletic content at WVU and a historian. I think he was far ahead of his time. The stories that you know people tell about Hot Rod, um, the amazing thing is not that he did them, but they're true. Hot Rod's journey to basketball immortality was filled with triumph and tragedy. His childhood was not easy. I mean, the guy was passed around from family to family in Charleston, and he didn't know where his next meal was gonna come from. But once he found basketball, the hero with the cowhide globe emerged, and the tales of his conquests on the court sound comical and mythical, like the one where he had a chance to break the Southern Conference scoring record. The game was in hand, and West Virginia was gonna win the game, and he goes up to the foul line, and the first foul shot he takes, he takes a hook shot, misses it. And the second shot he takes, he shoots it behind his back, doesn't hit anything. Afterwards, they said, well, why did you do that, Rod? He said, well, gives me something to shoot for next year. That's <laughs> the kind of, that's the kind of guy he was. And people here really took to that. He worked hard to be an entertainer. He, that was really gutsy of him to do those things in that day and age, to take those chances. Dan Lohman is the director of the documentary film, Hot Rod. He's been known as one of the greatest athletes in West Virginia history. We'd always heard about behind the back passes during games. Um, and that's really where I started to dig into it. I started looking at old films that we got converted over that had not been seen before. And all those things that we had heard about, when you don't really know if they happened, but in, until you see them on film, you go, yes, he did do those things. You're listening to somebody tell a story that is completely fiction. When they talk about, oh, Hot Rod would run behind the basket underneath the bleachers, go get a hot dog and come out on the other side while the game's going on and eat it, right? As the game's going on, I'm like, come on, no, he doesn't do that. Oh yeah, he did, yeah, he did. He took that thing, as they talk about, to, to heights they've, they've maybe never seen because he created this demand for the ticket. It was a show you had to be a part of. The JV games that he was a part of were, were the first games, right? They're sold out and then people would leave when the varsity game started. Hundley would joke, I built the field house, you know, I, I packed in it, you know, I built this coliseum because of the people that we, we brought into the field house during my days there. And Jerry would always answer, yeah, well, I paid it off. He was a man of the people. And I think common everyday people, coal miners that put in a day uh, in the mines would come and, and, and watch Rod Hundley. He was just a, 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 just a, a just a effervescent personality. And I think people here at West Virginia really embraced that. Hot Rod's hero's journey got a bit rocky once he left WVU. In his NBA career, because he was so busy living a party life, he was very open about that. And so were other people that we talked to that this guy, he didn't know a time of the day or night that he wasn't gonna look to have a good, have a good time. In Dan Lohman's film, Hot Rod's daughters didn't hold back when talking about their father. He still always had that, you know, positive attitude when he came home and happy to see us, but you know, kids wasn't really his thing. And he knew it. Like, he was not there for us. He didn't know what the hell to do with us. I think later in life, especially when he kept looking back, he noticed what he had thrown away. So absolutely, it was a redemption story. The hero's journey typically ends with the hero returning home. Would you please welcome a Charleston, West Virginia native who played the game with incredible flair, scoring West Virginia University brought Hot Rod home on January 23rd, 2010. To retire his number 33 jersey, he was flabbergasted that WVU would do this for him, according to John Antonin. I think because, because the only other player that had their jersey retired at the time was Jerry West. And when you think about Jerry West, he's up here. And I think when you get past Jerry West, everybody else is kind of a personal preference, including Rod, because Jerry was such a great player. So he said the best thing that ever happened to me was coming to West Virginia, and where, where people knew him and were gonna take care of him and whatnot. All you guys, I love you. And all you Mountaineer fans, I love you. You're the greatest, the best in the world. No question about it. So with that, 
Let's go Mountaineers. After the pomp and ceremony were done, a WVU employee gave Hot Rod a basketball and told him to shoot it. That was the showman in it. Now, the thing about Rod, um, you know, he had the ball, and I would say he was probably about maybe 15 or 20 feet from the, the rim. And knowing him, he inched in and got closer to where he knew he could make the shot. And of course, it was one of those where the ball didn't go directly in. It hit the basket, hit the rim, hit off the backboard and goes. But that was that was perfect for Rod because, you know, Rod was that cat that you set upside down and dropped and always landed on all fours. That was Rod Hunter. He was Peter Pan. I mean, his whole life was was like that. And for him to make that shot the way he did, that's a perfect analogy of his life. There's a lot of routine moments, but that one sticks out. It'll probably go down as one of the greatest moments in the history of that building. And what person of that age would ever in a suit, again, buttoned up suit. He didn't even unbutton. He just, yeah, I'm going to... Of course he's going to make the shot. Hot Rod's quest was not quite complete. He would dazzle a group of fans at a smaller venue the same weekend. His daughters convinced him to go to one of his old college haunts, Gene's Place. Al Bonner is the current owner. I mean, it was a, a good crowd anyway on a, on, a, on a Friday before a, you know, big, big uh, basketball game the next day when they were retiring his number. And... Uh, so he got out of the car here, and he walked in, and the place just erupted. I mean, it's just like, you know, nothing I'd never heard before in there, you know, other than, you know, scored a touchdown or, you know, something on a, on a you know, a big game or something like that. And the place just erupted, and people, everybody's cheering. And, and uh, his three daughters are sitting at the end of the bar down at the far end, and they're just watching it. He spent three hours behind my bar, just pouring beer, taking pictures, you know, for people. And, and people were getting a beer from him. And then they were coming up, carrying their glass, said, I want to buy this glass. And want a bag, and they wanted to have the, the beer glass that Hot Rod poured them a beer in. And there was a guy here uh, named Bill Kennel that saw him play when he played down at the, the field house. Bill was right there, and he started talking to him and, and just, you know, and, but his daughters are just watching the whole thing happen, you know, and it's just like, you know, what is happening here, you know, and and because uh, they certainly didn't expect, I don't think, you know, and from what they said, you know, they had no idea what Hot Rod meant to people and to this town uh, until they saw this stuff. I've been here 38 years and it was the greatest day I ever had there. And these people told me he brought this town together in a way that nobody else had ever done. And they said, do you understand what your father meant to this town? And I said, I'm, star I'm starting to get it. We had tears in our eyes. And then they said to me, your father's a hero. Hot Rod died in March of 2015 at the age of 80. In February of 2016, West Virginia made sure his legacy would live on, dedicating a statue in honor of the mighty Mountaineer basketball player. On that day, documentary filmmaker Dan Lohman was focused on Hot Rod's daughters. To watch them was, was very emotional. And I think that that also made them feel like, just, I mean, how, how can you not be on, on, top of the, on top of the world at that point to see a statue of your dad unveiled? But for, for other folks, you take that and then you take the, tying it together with the documentary, it, a lot of folks came up and just said, thank you. Thank you for telling the story. And other folks would talk and say it about their parents or their grandparents, yeah, you were telling the truth. All that stuff did happen. Whether we want to admit it or not, every family has its flaws. So I think that people gravitate, gravitate, people gravitate towards something like that because they want to feel a real story and they want to relate to it. Hot Rod's hero's journey is not one of perfection, but it ends perfectly. And for Dan, it's summed up in Hunley's likeness outside WVU Coliseum with Hot Rod shooting that hook shot. There were publicity photos made of him uh, in that stance, but that's who he was. It was kind of like in a way, I'm gonna go for it. It was that hook shot mentality of, let's see what happens. Coming up next, three Mountaineers from the old world attempt to fulfill their football destinies. Welcome back to BYU Radio's Big Stories. 
When you scan the West Virginia football roster, you notice that most of the players are from the East Coast. You even have some natives of Morgantown, West Virginia on the team. But as you keep perusing, you discover a guy who isn't from the birthplace of packing the pigskin into the end zone. In fact, he's not even from North America. Moi, mun nimi on Edward Westerinen. Mä pelaan puolustuksen linjaa ja mä käyn kouluun Länsi-Virginia yliopistossa. Tämä on mun kolma, kolmas vuosi tänä vuonna ja kaikki asiat on mennyt tosi hyvin ja olen tosi innoissani. My goodness, whatever you said, it sounded wonderful. According to Google Translate, he said his name is Edward Vesturinen. He plays defensive line, goes to school at West Virginia University, and that this is his third year. I'm from Helsinki, Finland. It's the capital of Finland. How does a guy from Finland, where the most popular sport is hockey, end up in West Virginia playing football? So the first time that I found out about American football was uh, through YouTube. I saw a YouTube video. It was a compilation. I think it was a big hits compilation on YouTube. And I was like, wow, okay, like this is really cool. People get to do this. Then next thing, I found out a local team in my area in Helsinki. What was it that captured your attention that you're like, I want to give this a try? I think it was the physicality that you can you can you can hit people as hard as you can. That's what I was struck out to me. The level of detail and the strategy that really got me excited about the running plays. And I think it was the, like, it's like a chess match and with the physicality, that's what really got me into the sport. Europe is a hotbed for football. Americans usually call it something else. I was a soccer goalkeeper on a pretty high level up until I was 13. This is Mountaineer tight end, Victor Vikstra. He's from Sweden. I've always been a big kid, and I had a lot of trouble in soccer, always getting yellow and red cards just for, like, being bigger than the other kids in my age. Um, and now when, when I was introduced to football, I could actually hit people and uh, use my size uh, for whatever I, was, I would have to use it for, and I, would, I wouldn't get penalized just for being big and I'm into fishing and one of my fishing buddies he came uh, he came and told me that he attended this like local football uh, play time or whatever you want to call it. it wasn't really a practice and he just told me it was really fun and I went there one time and it was uh, actually like a conditioning workout but I loved it so much we were running around inside um, just like bouncing against the walls with like old helmets and pads. So I quit soccer probably a week after that, after playing soccer for almost 10 years. And, and it all happened really fast. And then I was just playing football. My name is Jairo Fafiris. I play uh, inside linebacker by West Virginia University. Is that the most Mountaineers? <laughs> Netherlands native and WVU linebacker Jairo Fafiris discovered football in a different way. We had a, a program that introduced us to flag football. I was just walking through school and then someone tapped me was like, yo, are you interested? Hand me a flyer. It was like, you want to come to a tryout? Da, 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 da. I'm like, yeah, definitely. Let me go check it out. And then uh, I, I played that and I was like, I really fell in love with the game just for, through flag football. And I was like, wow, there's a version where we can hit each other. Like that's similar to this. I was like, sign me up. So that's how I started with that. Jairo was 15 when he started playing tackle football. In fact, each of the trio lamented that they were a bit behind when it came to learning the game. Progression was a bit slow because of the guys teaching them. Edward gives a good example. My first couple of years, it was actually my teammate's dad who was the coach. And he had played in Finland for many years, but it was, um, they didn't have much knowledge about, about every position. They had like a general view, but it was hard for them to really improve my technique, like D-line wise. Victor had a similar story. You learn how to tackle and catch the ball. We did have a playbook, and you, you like, it were that complicated. But if something went wrong, you just run straight and catch the ball or tackle someone. It was really basic in that level. So for three years, it was all about running around, tackling, catching balls, just for because it was fun. Um, coaches are not paid over there, so they just tell us to run around, basically. 
<laughs> when I was 16, I moved an hour away from home to attend a, um, a high school that was the only one that had football um, as a part of their program. It was a normal school. You just had football mornings and afternoons. Of course, it was different from here, but we were extremely focused on physical conditioning and strength. Football too, of course, that's when like the details started to take off and I started learning more about A gap, B gap, uh, coverages, uh, play schemes and all, all, all that. Once I made the transition from flag football to tackle football, I was surrounded with some people who actually knew what they were doing pretty well for the circumstances that we're in. So I think it was a very slow and steady progression though. I think I didn't really necessarily see a big jump until the age of 17, 18. Once I started playing for like the national uh, junior team, I moved from uh, from the Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and I moved to the United Kingdom, and I played for a team called Bristol Pride. That is a, like a high school developmental team over there. Uh, and then through that, I ended up like gaining some film and still doing a bunch of camps, like while being in the UK, saving up money to go all over again, just doing camps. Jairo, Victor, and Edward each got in contact with Players Premier International. It's an organization that promotes European football players to college football programs, including showcases and social media hype. Edward attended a camp in Germany. It was like U.S. college football coaches came over to look at those like camps, and that's how I got my name out there. And also through Twitter. Twitter is really important for me. That's how I got my marketing, and that's how coaches saw me. I was posting videos every day like new like workout I was walking on my hands I was trying to think <clears throat> out, out of the box so how, how can I make myself like differentiate from other people how can I stand out and it took me a couple months to, like to post every day videos on Twitter and then uh, my defensive coordinator he he reached out to me and that's how the recruiting process started Jairo ended up as one of the top college football recruits from Europe you were offered by Georgia Tech, Maryland, Minnesota, Penn State, Rutgers. Those are some good football teams with some crazy football traditions. So why West Virginia? Honestly, uh, West Virginia just felt like home. This is one of the few places I went to that I just immediately felt like a sense of like welcomeness and like of, of home where I was like football just mattered so much to the people. Like, no, no, disrespect intended to the other places, but I feel like West Virginia was just really a state where Football is just really a big part of the culture and a big part of everything that they do. All three of them learned that football was a lot faster and tougher in the U.S. Victor and the others also had to learn to get used to living far away from home. At one part of my first year, I just broke down and I like, like I, I was so sad. And for probably a week, I was talking to my parents and all the guys and thinking if I should quit and they they just encouraged me to do what I want to do and not like, they didn't tell me anything. They were just supporting me. And then I, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, pull through this, like to the end of the year. And if I still want to quit, I'll do it. But then there was a coaching change and that changed a lot for me. So I decided to stay. And then since then it's never been an issue. Victor and Edward also lean on each other as roommates. The first two years, they were at West Virginia University. Whenever things happened here that we didn't like, we could always, we could always hate about it together. Like we wouldn't have anyone telling us what to think or not, um, and we always like supported each other. So that's probably been a huge help. And then there are the stories of educating their American teammates. Believe it or not, a lot of Americans I had to, I had to educate in that we do not speak one language called European. We have we have our own languages. <laughs> I had a presentation for my D line, D line group. Uh, I told them about the geography where we are. We are right next to we're neighbors with Russia and Sweden, and Norway. And um, I told them about how many people are in my country and. I actually thought a couple of words to my teammate. He, he knows how to say, hello, how are you? My name is, how are you? You know, those type, I, I taught him those words. It's nice that someone's very curious about my language and my culture. I would say I would just miss my culture. I, I'm from a 
like uh, Helsinki is right next to the ocean. I love the ocean and food, of course, food. I, lo- I would love, love to eat some reindeer. Victor, Edward, and Jairo plan to preach the gospel of football in their home countries once their playing days are done. I will absolutely bring everything I learned here back home to make uh, future generations, uh, to make it easier for them to pursue their dreams as a college football player if they want to, and just teach them whatever I, whatever I learned here. A lot more Europeans, uh, European kids are trying to get recruited, so I think definitely being someone who has done it, some of the, I guess, forefront guys uh, of, the, of our generation being that we definitely have our responsibility and opportunity to give back to, to our culture and to our community. Before Edward becomes a teacher, he first wants to become a master at his craft. I feel like there's a lot to prove. I mean, there's, there hasn't been a Finnish NFL player active, an active roster ever. So that, that's the thing I want to accomplish. And I want to prove Americans. I want to show how us Finns, we are very hardworking and very reliable people. And there's a lot, a lot I, can, I want to prove to everyone about, because here, I think when I come here, I represent everyone that I grew up with, everyone in my country. I, I represent like the whole football community back home. And I, I just think like they deserve, they deserve the best because they, they've had a lot, a lot of tough times. And I think they just need a lot of, they need to see something like me accomplish things. Thanks for listening to BYU Radio's Big Stories. It's produced and written by me, Cleon Wall. Music and post-production by Kevin West. Thanks to WVU Athletics, Pikewood Creative, and WVRC Media. Make sure you watch BYU TV's Big Stories by logging on to BYUSN.com. Big Stories is a production of BYU Radio.